Hello, my name is Philippe Newland, and this is the Pinot Noir class of the Fairleigh Dickinson University online wine course, here being filmed at the International School of Hospitality and Tourism Management. We are going to start off uh, with a brief discussion of what hopefully you've gone over in your course notes and uh, talk a little bit about what is perhaps the holy grail of noble wine grapes, at least among the red grapes, and that is Pinot Noir. So, Pinot Noir, this is really one of the great grapes of the world. And it is, uh, but it's a difficult grape. It is a thin-skinned, finicky grape. Difficult to produce, difficult to grow, difficult to, to actually vinify. Um, but why do people do it? And why do they do it around the globe? It's because it gives some of the greatest wine there is on the planet. Pinot Noir has its origins, we believe, in Burgundy and France, and it's generally considered to be the best growing region in the world. Uh, it was a wild plant, and as you'll see, or maybe you've seen already in uh, our other tape on Pinot Gris, it's a, it's a grape that's prone to mutating. And it, I guess that adds, in a sense, to its complexity, because you can have different types of Pinot Noir, even within a particular vineyard, believe it or not. So Pinot Noir is a thin-skinned grape which likes to grow in cooler growing regions. It doesn't need a lot of heat. It doesn't want to get cooked. Some grapes need a lot of heat and a lot of light, like Cabernet Sauvignon. Pinot Noir is the opposite. It's the Goldilocks grape. It doesn't like it if it's too hot. It doesn't like it if it's too cold. It needs it to be just right. And what we'll find as we look across the different regions that we're going to explore here, um, which will take us from Europe to the USA and even down to New Zealand and Chile, we're going to find that Pinot Noir is growing in cooler regions. And this is very important because in the end, what Pinot Noir delivers so beautifully is not power, it's not richness, it's subtlety and perfume. Those are the things that the great Pinot producers look to convey in their wines. So to start off, we're going to begin with a wine from Burgundy. This is the Pomard from Louis Jadot. Pomard is a particular village in Burgundy. And this is the 2006. And I think you'll find that this is a classic example of Pinot Noir in its greatest growing region. So if you will join me, we have these wines laid out in these beautiful glasses provided by Riedel North America. These are the Venom Extreme Pinot Noir glasses. And it is appropriate that we drink Pinot in great glasses because it's, again, so much about the perfume. And I think what you'll find is the concentration of aromas that this glass provides is going to make the experience all the more enjoyable. So if you'd like to join me, we're going to start off with the Pomard from Louis Jadot. As you're tasting, I just want to draw attention to one thing that's pretty common among all these wines. Well, it is, across all of them. You'll notice that Pinot Noir, as a red grape variety, produces wines that are actually lighter in color. You can pretty much read through any of these wines. It's definitely sort of a, a ruby tone. And when you see that a wine is transparent like that, you can imagine that it doesn't necessarily have a lot of uh, contact with skin. And why is that important? Pinot Noir is not going to have a lot of tannin. It's going to be a softer red wine. And maybe that's one of the reasons that it's so appealing, particularly to chefs who want to showcase their food with a beautiful wine. It's going to be also a lighter bodied wine. Pinot Noir is generally, I'd say, a, a light to medium body wine. And for those of you who are into those big, powerful wines, this is going to be a different category. This is going to show a little more elegance, a little more subtlety. OK, so has everyone tried our first wine? So what I would like to do is ask uh, what sort of aromas you're getting and what sort of fruit flavor profile you're, you're feeling. because. To me, we're going to see different things. It's, it's very much a grape that shows sort of where it's grown. Um, but I think there are going to be some common threads. So who would like to start off? 
Yes, Michael. The aromas that I smell is um, very spicy with some, I don't know when I taste it or when I smell it, I taste a little bit of uh, blueberries and then it turns to spice. Mm -hmm. So those are the fruit flavors and spice that I taste and smell. And how about uh, the body? What do you sense with regards um, to the body? I think it's a very medium or too light body. And acidity? Hmm. Does it make your mouth water? It does. Does. It so does. You can tell that it has a fairly pronounced acidity level, which makes your mouth water. And that's great because that's going to take you back to your food. And then you're going to go back to your wine. It's going to help to cleanse your palate and just make you hungry, which is, you know, again, in, in great wine growing regions, it's not just about the wine, it's about the wine with the food. Cynthia, do you have any comments to add on this? First wine. I wanted to comment on Mike's comment about the blueberries, which I think is always very interesting because besides cherry notes, the blueberries, if you think about blueberry as a fruit, it has very high acidity. So it's always very interesting to me when people take, you know, when you talk about blueberry because it has that, those flavor profiles, but it also has, you know, the same sort of acidity that you get in a blueberry, which I is would, really prevalent in this wine. And yeah, in the I would agree. Pinot Noir. I think that's a really good point. Uh, that you're getting these impressions of fruits that maybe have higher acidity. And when you think about it, Pinot Noir is at its origins a wild grape variety. And oftentimes, what's so wonderful about Pinot Noir is this mouthwatering acidity that sort of reminds one of wild fruits, like picking wild blueberries, wild raspberries, fruit that isn't necessarily overripe, but has still a real sense of vibrancy in its mouth-watering acidity. And I think that that's one of the things that makes it such a food-friendly wine. So, classic Burgundy, it's not all about the fruit. I think there's a little bit of earthiness here. This is still a young wine, it's only 2006, and it's worth saying that Pinot Noir sees some of its greatness in the fact that it is a grape very capable of aging. The wines can become mysteriously beautiful as they age. They can move from what is termed primary fruit, you know, tasting just like fruit, blueberries, raspberries, etc. And it, over time, as it ages in the bottle, it can develop totally different characteristics. It can start getting a little bit mushroomy, like nice mushrooms, and earthy, and sort of, there's a typical expression in French, in French which says um, that great Pinot with age can smell and taste of the forest floor after a rain. You know, there's something bright yet earthy there. And that is, I think, a mark of the complexity of a great grape, that it can achieve all these different things with age. Okay, so it's very interesting because we're going to jump here from classic Burgundy onto our first wine from the Southern Hemisphere, and this is the Jules Taylor Marlboro Pinot Noir, the, Re the Reckon, and it is 2009, and Marlboro is... Uh, at the northern tip of the South Island of New Zealand, which is an area very famous for Sauvignon Blanc, but there's great Pinot Noir being produced there. Uh, one of the other great regions of New Zealand is the central Otago region, um, Martinborough uh, on the North Island. And in general, we're talking again about areas where the climate is a bit cool. So this is gonna be rather different, and I'd like you to go ahead and taste it and tell me what you found similar to the first wine and what stands out as being particular to this growing area in New Zealand. And think about intensity and fruit characteristics. And as you're tasting, I'll just make a comment for those of you who are tasting along with us out there on the web. Um, I have in my right hand a Burgundy Pinot Noir and then in my left a New Zealand Pinot Noir and I'm noticing a distinct difference in color. The New Zealand is much deeper in color than our Burgundy wine. Ryan, what did you find in the second wine that was quite different from the first? The second one, I tasted more of like a cherry sensation opposed to the blueberry. And I think it had more of an acidic like, taste to it, to the palate. And it was pretty dry, so that's I guess similarity-wise, it was really dry with the first wine. Okay, but that was really about it. Okay, and Al, what what are you seeing here that uh, struck you? 
Uh, first of all, I found the nose much different. I, I thought it was an earthy, pungent nose, maybe even a little bit of dried figs. Okay. Um, but the, the flavor was just, I got a bright, sweet, red cherry flavor, you know, much richer than the first wine. Yeah. A lot more fruit forward. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think that um, in this wine, the aroma is right off the bat more intense. Um, and there, there's a bit of spice to it and a real sort of cherry, red cherry, almost cola type of note. And to me, overall, this is a wine of greater intensity right off the bat. It's, it's brighter and it's deeper color. It's soaring out of the glass. And although, Ryan, I totally agree, the wine is dry, 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 it finishes quite dry. There's a sense of sweetness as it runs through your mouth, on your tongue. It's not a sweetness of sugar. It's a sweetness of really ripe red cherry. You really feel that this is a primary fruit type of wine. What do I mean by that? It means you really feel the fruit. Uh, and that's wonderful. And how is it different from the first wine? I think in our first wine from Burgundy, the Pomard, first of all, the color is a little bit, it's not as intense. It's actually moving a little bit to sort of a, a leaf color. And the aromas are more muted. We talked about blueberry, and I think there's higher acidity in the first wine, maybe a cooler climate, and a little bit earthy. So you sense we call Burgundy part of the old world and New Zealand is part of the new world. And you sense here in the Burgundy, it's something a little bit more restrained. And in the new world, this New Zealand, it's sort of jumping out at you. You know, it's, And you'd think what kind of foods I might pair with one versus the other. And I think you'd probably pair something a little more subtle with the French wine and something maybe a bit more intense with this more boisterous New Zealand wine. So right off the bat, we have two wines, same grape, really pretty different. Okay, let's move on. We're gonna taste the next two together because they're both from the general same growing region. We have uh, in our third wine, the Tavola from Ponzi Vineyards. And this is from a part of Oregon known as the Willamette Valley, 2008 vintage on the Tavola. And then Erath is a broader appellation, uh, meaning it, it's just stated as being from the state of Oregon. It isn't as specific. Uh, this is also 2008 Pinot Noir. So we're in a climate on the West Coast that's somewhat rainy, somewhat cooler than, say, California. And it's that kind of cool climate which is showing to proving to be the right place in the United States for growing Pinot Noir. If you were to ask somebody, who knows their wine a little bit, their American wine, what's the best growing region in the U.S. for Pinot Noir in general terms? People, nine out of 10, are gonna point to two places, Oregon and also California's coast. And we're gonna look at that next. But for now, let's go ahead and look at these first Pinots from Oregon. And look at the color, just to start off, because it's quite different. And thinking about wine a little bit more now, when you see that deeper, more purple color, it should tell you something versus a lighter, sort of more gentle ruby color. Just think about that. On color, what are you seeing between these two wines? Um, okay, just as you said, actually, I feel that number three is a little bit more purplish than number four. And what I really like about number three is that in comparison with the other two that we try to, it's a little bit smoother. And I still go through like the red kind of fruit. Like, I don't know if you agree with me, but it feels a little bit like strawberry white. But then I feel a little bit of leather too. And it's spicy, but it's not like, like itchy. Like for example, in number two, like it itched a little bit in my neck, like, and I could feel it all the way down. But now it's a little bit more smoother. So it's actually pretty tasty. And when I think of number three, I'm just thinking of like eating something like, like a steak or something with like a heavy 
brown cream, like a marsala mm. type of sauce. Mm. So it really makes me like water my mouth. So you, <laughs> that makes me wanna when I have something uh, to go with it. So this is making you think of food. Yes. Clearly. <laughs> Michael, uh, number four, how is that different in color and, and other aspects? Number four is brighter than number three. It doesn't smell as spicy and I don't feel it's as, as um, acidic. Mm -hmm. I taste more of um, more of a fruity taste than number three. I think it's more fruitier. I'm not sure what fruit. Maybe like um, strawberries. Okay, so strawberries. we've been talking really a lot about red fruits. There's one thing that no one's mentioned yet, and I think you sort of see it in number three. Um, Pinot Noir is a grape that oftentimes is uh, put into oak. It can, it can basically be raised in oak barrels and, uh, and gain greater complexity. And I think that here in number three, you're getting a little bit of the sweetness of the oak. There's a little bit of a hint of vanilla in this wine. And I think that that works just fine with this lovely, fruitful and forward wine. It adds another layer to the richness of the wine. And yet at the same time, we're not moving away from what we, are we found through all these wines so far, which is that great mouthwatering acidity. Mm? As for number four, this is, uh, I, like the, I like the word that you used before, which is very smooth. You know, I think that in these wines, we're not seeing a lot of tannin. Sometimes you can find Pinot Noirs that have quite a bit of tannin, despite their thin skin. It's all an issue of balance. Um, but here, in both of these wines, these are sliding down pretty easily, pretty gently. I would say it's one remark I'd make. We have a wine that's specific in number three to a particular part of Oregon, which is Willamette. And then we have another wine, which is just Oregon. And to me, there's more intensity in the Willamette Valley wine. It's, it's got that very deep, bright color. It has a little bit of that oak, a little bit of, um, it has good concentration of fruit. And then in number four, we're finding a Pinot Noir that's very gentle, supple, easy. And talking about food, this is worth remembering. Pinot Noir is the great gap bridger of wines in the sense that it can go with fish. It can go with white meat. It can go with salads. It can go with red meat. If you're ever in a restaurant situation and you're stuck because different people have ordered different dishes, just go to the Pinot Noir because it has sort of the beautiful acidity to bridge different foods. It can have some richness to go with steak. It can go extremely well with fish, particularly oilier fish like salmon or maybe even lobster, crab, um, I don't know what your favorite fishes are, but it's very versatile. And that makes Pinot Noir really one of the great wines. It is just very user friendly. Okay, so here we are. We've gone through Burgundy. We've had a look at New Zealand, a couple of wines from Oregon. And now we're gonna move to another portion of our West Coast, and that is into the Sonoma Coast area, and, and actually Central Coast. And we're going to start off with uh, a great standard bear, the McMurray Ranch Sonoma Coast Pinot Noir. Uh, if you remember Fred McMurray, it's named after his ranch. And this is the 2008 from Sonoma Coast. And then we have from one of the uh, pioneers of Pinot Noir in California, Richard Sanford. This is Alma Rosa. Uh, from the Santa Rita Hills, which are just a little ways north of uh, Santa Barbara. If any of you have seen the movie Sideways, it's this area that was uh, filmed for the movie Sideways. And this is the 2007 Pinot Noir from Richard Sanford's Alma Rosa Ranch. So two wines from California. Let's see what we can find here. Now just, just to frame this, we're moving down the coast. It's 
maybe a bit warmer. It kind of depends on what nook or cranny the vineyard is. Um, let's see, let's think about, is the fruit more intense? Is it richer? What's different as we're sliding from Oregon down into California? And smell these wines. There's a distinctive smell in both of these wines. Anyone want to jump in? Okay, Shailene. Okay, I thought the uh, McMurray Ranch wine, um, very earthy, woodsy scent to it. Very spicy and very high in acidity. It's like really intense with the acid and the taste of it. And, and how about the um, texture of the fruit? The texture of the fruit was, I. Is it lighter or richer than the Oregon one? It's wines? a richer. Yeah. Yeah, it's a richer texture. And how about the Almarosa wine? The Almarosa wine um, wasn't as intense as the um, McMurray Ranch wine, but it was still more intense than the Oregon <laughs> wine. Again, a little bit more richness from the California Definitely sun. Definitely, much more rich, yeah. yes. <laughs> Maybe a little more subtle than the previous wine? Yes, yes. I think, uh, and before we move on um, to Jessica, I think that here you see the sun a little bit more. Um, you know, the Sonoma Coast is a great place for growing Pinot Noir because even though it's just one mountain range over from Napa, it's exposed to all the fog that comes off the Pacific and it really cools things down. So you can get that California sunshine, but you have the cooling influence of the fog. And it's great because the grapes get rich in terms of their fruit and their sugars, and you get you know, good alcohol levels, but at the same time, the acidities are still there because the temperature is moderated by the Pacific. Fantastic. And when you move down the coast, you know, again, you're in a situation where good sunlight, and this particular winery is tucked away further inland, but it's along a river, and it's a place where the mountain ranges, right in the elbow of California, where the mountain ranges don't run north to south, they actually run west to east. So even though it's inland, the fog can roll in. So in both of these instances, the growers have looked for places where they're getting California sunshine and getting richness out of the fruit, but the temperatures are kept down cooler because of the influence of the Pacific. If you try to make Pinot Noir in Napa Valley, go out and see if you can find a Pinot Noir from Napa Valley. You won't find them on the shelves. It's too hot. Pinot, again, needs that Goldilocks environment where it's getting ripe enough, but it isn't being cooked too hot. You know, it's kind of like a fine sauce. It needs to be very slowly cooked in order to get all of the nuance of flavor. And uh, that's hard to do. That's hard to do. And uh, that's often reflected in the pricing of Pinot Noir. It's not an easy grape to grow. Let's do a quick experiment. Let's go back to the first wine from Burgundy because I think that's at the opposite end of the spectrum. Just go ahead and taste that again. And I want to ask you all about the fruit level in this wine after tasting these two California wines. So what I'm going to ask is to tell me about the fruit, the sweetness, the dryness, before we move on to our last wine, which is from Chile. But let's talk about California versus Burgundy here for a second. As we go back to Burgundy, what surprises you now that you taste this wine? How about Cynthia? No, I just think it's very um, clear that from Burgundy, from the Pomal, which had so much subtlety and nuance, and uh, to move from that to what we just tasted, the Sonoma Coast McMurray Ranch or the El Marosa from Santa Rita Hills, it seems like, you know, you go from very subtle to something a lot more, um, how, how should I say, just less subtle on the other spectrum of it. More intense. And, yeah, definitely, and a lot more, you're going from red fruits or red fruits and spice is something that's much more like black fruits for me. So a lot of, you know, that intensity is very, very clear. You definitely see it. And how about in terms of the sweetness and the dryness? I think that the California wines are a lot sweeter because they're riper, right? Mm -hmm. So just trying to think of ripeness more than sweetness per se. A lot riper fruits and it definitely shows up that way. I just keep going back. I feel like the Pomar has the most spice of all the wines that we tasted. And it's just, it's so transparent for me. You really taste the nuances, the different spices, and you know, to going then to the Sonoma wines, and um, it's just so different. It's it very, different, very different. It? 
I think that that's a really important point that uh, when you get back to the, Bur the Burgundy wine and you were using the word subtle and nuance, what you're finding here is something that's very much tied to the soil uh, versus these wines from New World places which are so happy in all of that ripe fruit. Not to say that they're not showing where they're from, but I think the emphasis is different. The fruit is really coming out in the Oregon and the California wines, and you go back to this wine from France, from Burgundy, and you, and you sense that it's so much more subtle, and it's, it feels more dry, not as sweet. And um, I think we have to, talking about Pinot Noir, talk about a concept called terroir, which is this French idea of, well, terre in French is the earth, and terroir is essentially the whole sort of environment around a given growing vineyard or a place where cheese is made or you know anything of artisanal food product. Um, it's not so much that the French are looking to express fruit in their wines. They would say, if I want fruit, I'll go and pick a fruit. What they would like to show is what the wine tastes like from a given place and what that soil puts into the wine. And we'll get into that in the Burgundy class because it is very important. But just mentioning it, we'll go back and we'll look at the Burgundy class. Um, terroir is a concept that's very important to the Pinot Noir grower because just like Riesling, Pinot Noir really shows where it's grown. Okay, so for the last wine in this Pinot Noir series, we are going to Chile which isn't traditionally known as a country for growing Pinot Noir. It's famous for its Cabernet Sauvignon, its Merlot, its Bordeaux varieties. But Pinot Noir is taking on more and more importance um, around the globe. I think a lot of people have, over the last few years, uh, become aware of how great a food wine Pinot Noir is. So to represent Chilean Pinot Noir, we, we have the Casiero del Diablo Reserve Pinot Noir 2009 from Concha y Toro. And uh, this is from Chile, so let's go ahead and try that. And I'd say give this wine a good shake in your glass. Get the aromas moving. And Chile, as I mentioned earlier, is getting started. There, it's not been a sort of standard bear grape down in Chile. And very important to Pinot Noir is figuring out where to grow it. And um, I'll start off just by saying, think about, uh, again, ripeness, think about alcohol level, and think about, is this a new world wine or is it an old world wine in the way it tastes? And is it a sweet wine or ripe sweet fruit is what I mean by that? Or is it earthy? Where are we here? Chile is discovering itself with regards to Pinot Noir and, and we're trying to discover it too, okay? Who would like to go ahead and make a comment? Yes, Al. Philippe, my take is it's a, it's a new world wine. Uh, and I think that the climate in Chile may have something to do because I find this very different than the others. Um, I kept getting eucalyptus on the nose. Mm -hmm. And, and I, uh, somebody had said sulfur, and I didn't, really didn't pick up sulfur, but I picked up that mintiness, maybe the earthy nose. Mm -hmm. um, and I found that I got a lot of fresh berry and plum in a flavor. I, I, I thought it was a pretty good wine. I, I could drink this. You could drink it. And how about texturally, like sweetness, dryness, and richness? What's your impression? I, it, it's, it's slightly sweet. It's, I, I, I find it pretty rich. I, I, I find I like a bigger wine, so I, I found it enjoyable. Very good. Yeah, I think there's a lot of... I think there's quite a bit of ripeness, quite a bit of richness in the texture. You can feel the alcohol a little bit in this wine. Um, is it subtle? Mm, maybe not. Maybe this is a little bit more, we were talking about steak earlier. Maybe this is more of a steak Pinot Noir. It seems a little chewy. There's a little bit of, of tannin chewiness in this wine too. And it's got good concentration of fruit. I mean, I'm feeling it right down the middle of my tongue. The fruit is sticking in there. I get a lot of spice in this wine too. That's why I sort of asked that question, is it old world, is it new world? Because I'm getting some secondary notes away from fruit. And I, I think it adds some complexity. Um, 
you know, I think it's a young wine still. I'd be interested to see it in a few years. And, and that's a, a good point. I mean, here we're drinking, tasting all of these fairly young wines, and Pinot Noir is a grape that's prone to improvement with age. 20, 25, 30 years for the really high quality Pinot Noirs, and it changes it completely. Uh, you start off with fresh, vibrant red and black fruits when they're young, and as I mentioned a little bit earlier, you can get into more foresty, woodsy. Woodsy was a comment that was made about this wine. Um, earthy notes. And amazingly, sometimes you can see that happen in your glass over a couple of hours as you work your way down the bottle. And that makes it a very, very interesting grape. So Pinot Noir is all about perfume, subtlety, medium body, very flexible with food, goes with a range of different foods. And with that, I think we'll close the Pinot Noir class. Come back for Red Burgundy. Okay, thank you very much.